Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to a thrilling video. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this because we're looking at 20 classic children's books that are also great to read as an adult. So you could do this with your children if you've got them, read them together. And I've done this because I've been asked so many times, what classics do you reckon I should read to help my children get into reading um, or to expand their reading or just to thrill them with the greatest stories because when it comes to children's classics story is king imagination and opening up the world is king in children's stories and some books have lasted and lasted and lasted because they're just that good so without further ado let's dig into our list just a couple of things I want to say before we crack on with this list, which are rather important. All of these books are great for children to read and adults. You can create some wonderful imaginary adventures, something to act out when you're on walks at times, um, if you read these together. Also, they are good for children to enjoy. Um, because I've read a, a number of lists out there which clearly haven't put much thought into them. For instance, some books that I've seen on children's classics are Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina by Tolstoy is about a thousand pages long with the main theme being adultery. I mean, is that really what you want your little children to be reading or, or even your tween children? Um, other books that are on there, Pride and Prejudice. I mean, really? That's not for kids. Three Musketeers. If someone's thinking of the cartoon in the 90s in Britain, I understand that. But the book has got scenes in there which an older teen might like, but certainly not younger children. So that's something. Jekyll and Hyde I've seen as well. I'm not so convinced that that's a great children's story. Um, no, not at all. I, I wouldn't put that down. These books that we're going to look at are thrilling um, or they're highly imaginative and open the eyes to wonder. And we're going right back in time and also close to modern. If you know me, I tend to say a classic is from 1980 and before. So 1980 is pretty much the cutoff point. The other thing is that these books are in no particular ranked order except for the last three, which I personally think are the th maybe the three greatest children's books ever written. So the first book in our list of 20 children's classics, this is a deliberate pick that I've put first because I want to show you that these books can be read um, by older children as well, um, and depending on the comprehension of your children too, depending, they might be young but have really good comprehension in stories, and that one is Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. This book, definitely beloved by adults. There is certainly, I could say, you could say it was written for adults, but children will love the fact that it's seen from Huck's eyes. What Twain does here is he captures the world almost more perfectly because he sees it as a child. He sees the hypocrisy, he sees the sense of fun and adventure, he sees the sense of danger, he sees the cant um, of adults, but it's laced with great, great humour. Ernest Hemingway considered this the best of American books. He says there was nothing before Huckleberry Finn in American literature, and there's never been a book better since. And yet it can be enjoyed quite easily uh, with a child, either reading on their own or especially with their parents or guardian. Um, even T.S. Eliot, the great poet, thought that this was one of the greatest works ever. So this is just to prove that the books on this list, don't poo-poo them as children's books alone. They are fantastic. So Huckleberry Finn, is number one on our list. If you haven't read it, read it. Oh, I do want to say just one thing about this. It does use um, the Southern dialect, and um, it's written phonetically, so sometimes that's a bit awkward to read, but you get into the swing of it soon enough, and be prepared that are some racial epithets in here which are not so pleasing to today's, um, not to everyone today, but of course, written when it was, it was acceptable. Our second book up was written in 1972 and is the wonderful Watership Down by Richard Adams. 
when it comes to just brilliance of painting, scenery, building tension, this writer is just exceptional. It is a delight to read. Now, the book, you may know the, the cartoon of the past, uh, Watership Down and the famous song Bright Eyes by Simon and Garfunkel. Um, but the book itself follows a group of rabbits who flee their warren at the beginning of the book. Now, Fiverr and, um, oh, what's his name? Hazel are the two main characters. But Fiverr has a sixth sense, and at the beginning he senses danger to the Warren. And so he asks Hazel whether they, he could leave, and a few of the rabbits leave the Warren and go on this massive adventure to find a new place to live. What's so wonderful about this when reading it with um, a young one, or just letting them read it on their own, is the perspective of environment. Adams creates scenery so beautifully well. I want to read you the first paragraph of this. It's so good. Um, but what, what it also introduces them to is just how humans affect the environment. Um, and just seeing it all peculiarly from the perspective of an animal and a small animal at that. They go on adventures through great woods and open fields. They meet um, different characters from, from the wildlife scenery. They cross roads made by man. They see machinery by man. They come across dogs and then they meet other rabbits with the malevolent presence of the black rabbit hovering in the background. This is a spectacular read for an adult and for children. Third up is the renowned classic Alice in Wonderland. Sometimes parents are put off getting this for their kids because they look at it and think, wow, that looks quite a dense book. If it's this fat, it's Alice in Wonderland and Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass. So it's actually two books if it's this thick. Alice in Wonderland is only about 100, 110 pages long and gives opens a world of absolute wondrous imagination. Of course, you know right away if I talk about the Cheshire Cat. You know who I'm talking about when I talk about the Queen of Hearts. You know who I'm talking about when I mentioned the Mad Hatter. But do you know how they all fit together? Do you know how Alice perceives it? Do you know how wonderful the setting is in which this is written? If your child is imaginative especially, this will give them a whole different scope for imagination. It takes it to another level. I almost was about to say something which gives away the end. I'm, I'm pleased I caught myself then. But the end also explains why this is such a thrilling um, piece of imaginative work. This will allow kids to slip away from the Xbox, from the PlayStation, and start finding different creatures in the back garden, out on walks, under the staircase. You know, it's just that kind of book. If you read it with them, you will be delighted as an adult that you've read it too. I wonder if you've heard of the fourth one on our list. It is actually quite a famous classic, but Surprisingly, not a lot of people seem to mention it today, and it is Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne. If you enjoy this book, or if your children enjoy this book, the wonderful thing is Ballantyne writes a whole load of other extremely adventurous books which they can dig into. This is likely the most famous of them all. So, in, in uh, the Coral Island, we start with the ship, the Arrow, great name for a ship, imaginative already and exciting. And there's a shipwreck just off Coral Island and only three young lads survive. Now, what are their names? Ralph, Jake and Peterkin. And all they've got with them is a telescope and a broken penknife. And so they set about trying to survive, building a hut, going fishing, all that kind of stuff. Later on, we get a group of cannibals invade the island and there's this huge threat. How are they going to deal with it? And on top of that, you get, um, what's his name? The pirate, or oh, is, it, is it Bloody Bill or something, Bill Blood? Something like that. The most fearsome of all cutthroat pirates. Um, it's just high adventure. It's a Robinson Crusonade or a Robinsonade because it's that trapped on a desert island. But it's actually written with a vocabulary which is easy enough to read, but sort of stretches the mind a little more. We'll introduce you to 
a different way of phrasing things, which is good. It's good for the growth of children as well. So maybe not the first one I'd start them with, but if they're already reading, Coral Island is certainly a great way to go. Fifth on our list is another famous classic, but it's a classic that really is written for adults. However, children will love the story. It captures the imagination. It's not um, high flights of fancy. It's sort of realistic. And that is Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. This is not the kind of book that every child will like, but yours might. So we have Phineas Fogg. Um, at the beginning, and he basically says, due to the uh, advance of the Industrial Revolution, it's now possible for a man to travel around the world in just 80 days, and people don't believe him, and he says, well, I'll bet you £20,000 that I can do it. And so off he sets with his um, sidekick and valet, Passeport too, um, so Passport or Traveller, and he has this immaculate itinerary of how to get around the globe through various means of travel. However, at the same time, somebody has committed a robbery and Detective Fix is sent out to find the person. Because at the same time of the robbery, Fogg leaves the country, Fix thinks it must be him, and so a pursuit happens, which you or a child reading this will recognise. It's a, it's a situational irony because Fog and Passport 2 don't know they're being chased yet. There are many things in, uh, where the, the, the travel is almost derailed, um, which is quite a funny pun if you've read the book. Um, there's going through jungles, there's going through open spaces, there's train journeys, there's riots, there's there's so many things. And then they meet the wonderful Uda, um, I think Auda, I think is her name as well. Will he make it back in 80 days? Will Detective Fix catch him? That's what this story is about. It is, it's such a good read. <laughs> the sixth book on our list, I would imagine the majority of you have never read maybe not even heard of. It is written in the year 1847 by an author called Frederick Marriott, and that book is Children of the New Forest. My wife loves this book. So it follows, it's actually set in a time period you don't get many books in. It's in the, seven, uh, the 1600s, so the 17th century. It takes place or starts in 1647 when King Charles I in the English Civil War has finally been defeated. Um, and so the roundheads are in charge and people who supported the Cavaliers are not looked upon very well. You get the Beverly children who um, their, their parents die, the, the house is dispossessed by the roundheads and they have to make their own way. And they meet a man in the New Forest, a, wood, a woodsman called Armitage, and he starts getting them to work with him on expanding his farmstead, learning practical survival skills, growing food, catching rabbits, all that kind of thing. And then you have the younger of the four, Edward, who he is quite entrepreneurial. He, he wants to look after the, the rest of the four and get their property back, get their inheritance back. If you've never read this book, this was a book beloved by children of the Victorian age. It is great escapism with nice little filigree of history of the English Civil War. The rest of the books I no longer have on my shelves because I either lent them out to families a long time before or through cleansing my library, they've unfortunately gone. But the seventh book is, unsurprisingly, Charlotte Webb. I think a lot of you will have read this. If you haven't, get hold of it. It's written by the brilliant E.B. White, the famous great essayist, although a lot of people don't recognise this about him. He had a, such an acute sense of humour and observation and of people, um, sort of sociology kind of thing. Now, in this book, we have... The little girl, Fern Arable, which is funny because she grows up on a farm in Arable land. And she pleads with her dad one day when the pig has given birth that he doesn't get rid of the runt, that she's allowed to take care of the runt, whom she calls Wilbur. And so she raises him. But a year later, Wilbur is sold to another farm where he's, he's you know, he's now rather big. And obviously he's being raised to be slaughtered. 
The other animals don't particularly like Wilbat and they won't talk to him, so he's ostracized much like he was when he was a runt, except just where Wilbur stays in the barn, just above him on the doorway, is a spider called Charlotte. And she befriends Wilbur. She talks to him. Fern comes and visits and she listens to them um, talking and she gets to listen to the conversations of animals, but she gets distracted as she grows older. And it comes to this point where Charlotte the spider has to work out how to keep Wilbur from being killed. And you get this enduring friendship. I am not going to spoil so much of it, especially the brilliant ending, but it's written spectacularly well. Children will love it because children love to hear animals talk, their imagination, their anthropomorphizing. Um, but like the, the brilliance of E.B.'s writing often comes out. There's one scene which anyone who's read the book keeps talking about or refers to it as a great, um, where you almost drop into the story and that's when they're on the rope swing at the farm. It's just beautiful writing. And that's not the only piece. This is like Richard Adams with Watership Down, a fabulous, fabulous piece of work. One, in fact, my sister particularly enjoyed. The eighth book on our list is a book that once you've read it with your children, they will want you to read it to them again. But it's also one where the film is great and you can follow it up. It's Arthur Ransom's Swallows and Amazons. So in this, you've probably heard of it, you have the four children, the Walker, uh, is it the Walker children? They go on holiday to the Lake District and they get a dinghy, they find a dinghy which is called Swallow and they set sail on some hijinks adventures across the lake. So what are their names? John, Susan, Titty, and uh, Arthur? I don't think that's right, but there's another one. And they meet the Blackett children on one of the islands, um, Nancy and Peggy, who live in a house on the mainland. But the walkers have set up, um, is it Wildcat Island? There aren't, it's been a long time since I read this. Um, they set up their camp because, you know, back then in 1930 when it was written, obviously all, all parents that went on holiday were delinquent and let their children run everywhere on their own. Now, what happens is they and the Blackets unite to wage a war on the Blackets' uncle, um, Mr. Turner, who's become rather taciturn in writing his memoirs. There are events where Mr. Turner gets angry with the Walker children and blames them for things. And he won't listen to them, even when they warn that there's burglars around. And then there's an incident where a boat is pinched. And so begins an even more exciting adventure with whisperings coming from other um, islands and the children having to intercept a great planned um, heist. Um, I'm not going to say any more, but you can see that already being set in a wilderness, rowing on a lake, playing pirates, finding bandits and robbers. This is the stuff that children's dreams are made of. So that was the eighth one, Swallows and Amazons. Ninth on the list is one of the most renowned children's classics, which is an absolute joy to read as an adult. And it is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. In fact, all of the Chronicles of Narnia, including Prince Caspian and Voyage of the Dawn Treader, um, you have The Sorcerer's Apprentice at the beginning. They are all fantastic, but there's one that's actually missed a lot, and that's A Horse and His Boy. That is such a good book. However, I'm going to focus on The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I don't think I need to say much about it. The, most of you have seen the films on it, and most of the films are pretty accurate. Um, the four children who are hi playing hide and seek during the wartime uh, in, in a, is it, is it their uncle's big mansion? Something like that. And they, uh, they enter into the wardrobe and end up in Narnia, which is in permanent winter and Christmas has been outlawed by the White Witch. And you meet all these characters which C.S. Lewis has drawn from ancient writings of antiquity, the Greeks, the Bible, and put it all together in one of the most satisfying tales ever. So that's The Land, the Witch and the Wardrobe, but the whole Chronicles, six books in all, are actually really, really good. And I highly recommend reading A Horse and His Boy. Um, that is the second book, I believe, or maybe the third book in, in the Chronicles. What a great story. 
I think we're on book 10 now, I'm beginning to lose count, but this one changes the mood quite a lot and is a great book to introduce to young ones in order to learn morals and to get a different aspect on life. And that is Anna Sewell's Black Beauty. Wow, this is a potent book. What's so good about it is the brevity of the chapters. It's almost the memoirs of a horse, Black Beauty, starting with, uh, talking in the first person, um, starting with their life in the open fields on a farm in the country and the joys that that brings and the life of a horse and the pleasures and the love of other humans and then how they end up in Victorian London. Of course, horses being used for the main part for transport and for pulling carriages along um, and for cargo and the horrendous difficulties that horses went through, the cruelty, the maltreatment, the abominable living conditions, um, just being sheer scared out of their wits. Anna Sewell knew a lot about horses and she wrote this actually to bring an awareness to the public of the treatment of horses and it had an effect, so it was a social novel. Um, but each lesson is, is sort of laced with a moral of maybe sympathy or kindness or don't be cruel to animals, that animals have feelings. Um, it's just so miraculously put together, but it feels, and this is the thing, like a lot of the books on this, there's adventure, which is great for children, it's the main thing they like, but this feels real. A lot of the, as the chapters add up, London begins to take on a very eerie presence and um, may inform your young ones of the imperfections of cities. So uh, there you go, Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, the only book she ever wrote, comes in at number 10. Eleventh on our list is another famous classic children's book, and it is The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett, which is a tongue twister. Try and say her name three times. Um, so in this, you've you've still got that vibe of it's not high adventure but what children love about this and if you read it with them they get drawn into it because they find themselves there they know the feelings that these children go through they know the sense of um, loss they know the sense of isolation they know the sense of being angry with adults and this gives so much meaning to their own feelings and is a great way to take them into deeper motifs of literature. So the main character is Mary Lennox. She's a 10 year old in India when her parents die. Her parents have neglected her really. Um, they die of cholera. She's shipped back to live with her uncle in the countryside of Great Britain. While she's there, her auntie tells her stories of, um, I think their names were the Cravens. Anyway, they were these people who, they had a secret garden, a walled garden in the, the grounds, it wasn't secret at the time. And was it 10 years prior, uh, the, the woman that used to love being in there, she died of an accident inside the garden. Anyway, one day Mary Lennox, she's walking around and she's got a friend, which is a Robin Redbreast, who points out this bare patch of earth to her, brings attention to it, and she sees a key and she finds the door which is overgrown to the secret garden she lets. And she needs some tools to get in. So she asks one of the servants who sends her 12 year old brother, Dickon, he comes and they both go in the garden and they go in there regularly and they talk and they get to know each other. And it's that, that story of a blossoming friendship. Um, children will recognize the conversations they have. They will be invested in the characters rather than just the action. Later, she will meet another boy she didn't, knew nothing of called Colin, if I remember rightly who he's um, very sickly, hasn't been out of the house in years. And she, she tries, he's very nasty to her, but through sympathy and kindness, she melts him down and softens him. She tells him about her adventures in the secret garden. He wants to go. And so she takes him out there. And so the story goes. And there's so much in there, pleasant little scenes, which your children will love mostly. Not all children like this book, but it's definitely one to try with them. Um, because it's deep and it's got feeling, it's very, it's got emotion, which will help them explore themselves, which is what good literature should do. Our twelfth book, um, if I were to mention the names Bobby, Peter and Phyllis, would you know what I'm talking about? How about if I said Edith Nesbitt? Well, you've probably got it now. It's the 1906 children's classic, 
The Railway Children. And what a spectacular classic it really is. There's a romance about steam trains which exists up to this day. Uh, they're just beautiful works of art and they captured the imagination of the young children as well who have left London to live at a house in the country by a railway track called the Three Chimneys with just their mother and um, a servant. And it's because they don't know, but their, their father who works for the Foreign Office has been arrested and imprisoned for being a spy. Now, the kids don't know this, so they just know their dad's not around. Anyway, they decide they want to go on adventures in their area to explore, and they, they go up the railway track. They actually come to befriend a guy who regularly passes on the 915 train, um, whose name they don't know, but they wave at him. I think one time they hold up a sign asking for help with food, and he sends food to the train master. Um, eventually, this man will help resolve the problem of their father being arrested and imprisoned falsely. That's really the theme here, which gives it a bit of excitement. It raises the indignation in, in a child um, of someone that's been falsely accused of some, something. There's also a Russian character who they meet who wrote this beautiful book all about poor people and how they need help, but he's been thrown out of his country. And of course, we're talking about the dissidents against the Tsarist regime of Russia. And interestingly, Nesbitt knew, knew a, a dissident called um, Stepniak. There was another one, Kropotnik, I think it was. And that's based on that. So it brings up a little bit of what goes on in the real adult world. However, the main energy and thrust comes from the children's arguments, the children's plans to help out their mother, and things like trying to get coal, which is a really funny bit with Peter stealing coal from one of the, the trains, and stopping trains from crashing as well. So it's just a great building, but it's a venture on your doorstep. It's like within your reach, it's not a mythical place. And there's a reason it's been beloved for over a century. If you've never read that one, I highly recommend reading it with your children because they will be gripped. Our 13th book has great fond memories for me personally. I was introduced to it by my dad who himself loved it as a kid. Um, I think the books were written in the 50s by a guy called Anthony Bookeridge and it's the Jennings series. Um, the first one in the Jennings series is Jennings Goes to School, and it's about a young lad called Jennings who goes to stay at a boarding school and his experiences there. He gets, a, he makes a friend with a lad, I think his name's Derbyshire, is the lad who's a bespectacled, quite fragile and not very robust character, but they're very good friends. And what's so good about it, it is hijinks. The older ones in boarding school bully them, and it's the way they get their revenge, it's the way they run circles around teachers, it's the mischief and the mysteries that they get themselves into, and it's just beautiful. It's just, I've never been to boarding school, but as a youngster, I related so much just to the solving of problems, getting out of tricky situations like being bullied and all that kind of stuff and angry teachers and just sheer funniness. And that's the one thing Anthony Bookeridge brings into this set particularly is their comedies. Um, it will have your children laughing. I suppose this is maybe, maybe more for boys than for girls. Um, and I'm sure there's a girl's alternative. I don't know if it's a classic, but I know my sister's read books similar to Jennings, and that one was called Hairs on the Palm of Your Hand, and that was set in a girl's school, so I thought I'd bring that up just in case. Um, so there you go, I'm gonna say no more about it because I can't remember that many details. I do remember the football match with Derbyshire's shoelaces being tied together. And that was really, really, my mum read it to me and my mum was crying with laughter. And I still have that memory to this day. Do you see the beauty of reading classics to your kids? The 14th book on the list is the most recent of the books and was written in 1980 by Lynn Reed Banks. Um, you, so a lot of you will already, especially my American cousins will probably know what's coming. And it's The Indian in the Cupboard. Whoa. Now, I remember my mum reading this to me as well, and it's one of the most enduring stories I remember having read to me. So you have a young lad called Omri, or Omri. He's nine years old, it's his birthday, and he's pretty flat because his friend Patrick has given him, as a present, a very small um, Native American Indian figurine um, of an Iroquois um, warrior. His mum gives him, of all things, a tiny medical cabinet. 
And what we're talking about here is a toy one, like so big. Anyway, he's bored and he's playing around with his new toys best he can, but he goes looking for a key and finds a key to his grandma's jewelry box, which actually fits the medical cupboard. And he plays a game and he puts the, the, the figurine of the Native American in the cupboard and locks it up. And then when he opens it, the figure has come alive. I mean, we're talking low fantasy, but this is wonderful. This is an adventure that takes place in your bedroom. I mean, this is great. Um, for ages afterwards, after my mum read this, I was going around putting all my Lego figures into shoe boxes and small places in the hope that one of them might come alive and be my friend. Um, but there you go. Uh, the, the, the Iroquois, his name is Little Bear. He thinks Omri is a god because he's so big, but he soon gets over that. And then Omri finds another character figurine that he's got, which is a cowboy. And he puts him in the cupboard and lo and behold, he comes alive too. And his name is Boone. Of course, they start fighting each other to start with, but eventually Omri gets them to be friends until there's an accident. I can't go any further because I don't want to spoil anything. Um, but introducing them to television was quite a funny bit that I remember. Um, and the scene with the rat, that was good. It's just a lovely fantasy book, which I remember playing on the floor while it was read to me. Um, and by the way, if you ever read to your children, don't make them sit and listen. Let them play while you read. They'll still take it in. Um, so Indian in the Cupboard is just a brilliant, brilliant book, which I highly recommend. I think practically every child would love it. The next classic children's book, I think we're on number 15, is super famous, but one of those most people haven't actually read, and it's Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows. Um, this is just beautiful. It's funny. It's thought-provoking. There's little snippets of wisdom. There's a bit of education comes through this. But the capturing of the scenery, it's such a pastoral novel. We're quietening down again. Kenneth Graham wrote some really, really beautiful stuff. Uh, the Golden Age is one of his, which, whew, um, yeah, some of the lines and sentences just capture a scene of, as an adult that you love. And his description of the canal where, where Otter lives. Um, and when they first go for their rowing trip up the canal and get lost, I think, did they drop their oars? I can't remember. But in the, in the book, you've got your main characters, which is Badger, who's old and sage and a bit grumpy. And you've got Molly, who's a bit timid and shy and whinges a bit. Um, and you've got Otter, who I thought personally was the coolest. And then you've got Toad of Toad Hall, who is hilarious. And Toad... He doesn't think things through, he's rambunctious, he's always wanting to get into adventures, he upsets his friends, but they all accept that he's good-natured. He gets a motor car, that's, you know, and he, the, the, the situations he gets himself in there. But what I particularly love is the description of the countryside. It's a world of humans without adults. It's nature in its finest. It calls you to animals. If you've got a child that loves animals or you love animals, read Wind in the Willows. You will be delighted with it. I mean, you will smile. There's something, you will, you will yearn for the whimsy of childhood when you read Wind in the Willows. It is just a lovely, lovely book. It's slower than most books, but sometimes you need to change that pace um, and to show children, uh, young ones, that there's a lot more inside books. So that's, that's number 15, Wind in the Willows. Number 16 on the list is another epically famous group of children for a children's book, um, written again in the 50s, I believe, by Enid Blyton, and you know where I'm going with this. It's the famous five. Julian, Dick, George the Tomboy or Georgiana, Anne and the dog, Timothy and all the adventures that they go on because their parents, like in Swallows and Amazons, are delinquent parents who just let their children go anywhere. Now, the first one in the series is actually brilliant. It's the one I, I remember gripping me most. And it's Five Go to Treasure Island. This is where they all meet. Three of them are, are, are siblings and Georgiana, she's um, a cousin, I think. And she takes them on a boat and they go to this island and they get on the island, which has got a bit of a rumble, uh, a ruined castle. 
Uh, of course, that's adventurous in itself because you want to know where it's going to go. And then they find a secret passageway. And from there, the story progresses. And, you know, there's, you know, is there buried treasure and gold ingots? Um, and then what about people who are coming to steal it all from them? You know, you get the adventure, you get the tension that's put in. Again, it's fantasy on your doorstep. Low fantasy, I suppose. It's not even fantasy, is it? It's, it's adventure on your doorstep. It's not having to go a million miles away. And of course, if your children love it, and I'm sure they will, I'm sure you may even enjoy it more because although it's a children's book, the great thing about classic children's books is the stories are so good that as an adult, you can't help but enjoy them. You know, I remember the first time I read Chronicles of Narnia. Wow, and you should see what's coming up in the last three um, as an example of this. Um, but there you go, The Famous Five. And of course, Enid Blyton wrote 21 books of The Famous Five. Nearly all of them took place in the summer holidays. So uh, by the time that the, they ended, all The Famous Five were in their 30s and Timothy the Dog was probably dead. <laughs> um, obviously, time was suspended in this. But... Again, a series of books which are absolutely riveting and well written. That's what I like about Enid Blyton. I personally think she writes really well. Nothing complicated, but just great plot. Because I'm not certain I got my count right up to this point, I just want to throw one more in before doing my top three children's classics that I reckon you should read with your children or at least give them to read. I just want to shout out Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl is the height of imagination. What a spectacular writer. There's so many books. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach, Fantastic Mr. Fox. These are written in the 60s. You've got The Twits, you've got Witches, you've got the BFG. Um, and one I would throw on there um, would be George's Marvelous Medicine. If, if you want to start with Roald Dahl, start your kids on George's Marvelous Medicine. George hates his gran grandma who lives upstairs. She's this nag who stays permanently in bed. And one day he has to give her her medicine. And she's so upset him that he thinks, I'll give you your medicine. And he takes her medicine and mixes it with loads of things that he gets from around the house. And stirs it all together into a soup and then gives it to her. Um, the amount of things he puts in there is enormous and it's just great as a, for a child, the sheer imagination, adding and adding and adding um, and using your imagination to think what other things can be added in and then what happens to her. She begins to cough and splutter and then she begins to grow. And so, I mean, I wouldn't say that's the beginning of the story, but that's the beginning of the after effects of the medicine and what George has to do to try, oh, he gives it to the chickens who also grow. Um, and he tries to fix what he, the problem he's made. It's just great. I think that's 1980. It might be 81, 82. Um, but it's close to, to being of the age of a classic. It's certainly a brilliant book, but plenty of Roald Dahl's are classics. Now, let's get on to my top three classics for children to read on their own. This includes older children and definitely all adults will love these books. In third place, Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. You might think as an adult, this is too childish. You might worry that your kids will think it's too childish. Because of their knowledge of what Peter Pan might be, they might think it's too little for them. Read it. And if you can get this edition with the illustrations by Robert Ingpen, all the better. Because, I mean, I don't know if you can see this, but look at these majestic, majestic pictures. Um, and they're all the way through. So, of course, we start with the, mainly it's Wendy, isn't it, uh, amongst the kids. And the parents go out for the evening and then Peter Pan comes in and is chasing his shadow who has escaped. And then they start talking and they give each other a thimble because a thimble is meant to be a kiss. And then Peter Pan talks about where he's from, Neverland, you know, what is it? Turn left at the second star or something like that. And off they go. Once you get into Neverland, this is imagination painted at its finest. Um, just sheer flight of fancy. Because, of course, you've got Captain Hook and Shmee and the Lost Boys and Tinkerbell and the Indians. And so on it goes. And it is just absolutely astonishingly good and has pathos. As an adult, there's parts of it you're like, no! <laughs> I love this book. Um, the way it talks about mothers. Oh, 
just beautiful. It will capture the imagination of young ones. I would say anyone who is in junior school um, at least will love this. You wouldn't want to read this to maybe someone who's 14 or 15. However, I would give it to your children if they're 14 or 15 and say, read it, trust me. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, and of course, I think if you buy Peter Pan, I think the proceeds to it go to the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children because J.M. Barry contributed it to them. He gave the rights to the book to them, which have been kept in perpetuity. Tossing up the last two books between which one would make first or second was so difficult, but I eventually came down on my decisions, which some people are not going to like, especially the raving fans of this author. But in second place, a book I've lent out and hasn't come back yet, but I don't mind because kids are reading it, is The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. The Hobbit will introduce your kids to sci-fi fantasy, okay? Um, real great medieval fantasy, I should say. Um, it's just Bilbo Baggins and his adventures going off. You know, it's, what do you say about this? I mean, there's not much that I, I can say that you don't already know. You know, meeting with his friends and, um, is it Thorin and Torin, the two dwarves, the great battle at the end, which has some of the, oh, again, strikes you to the core. The development of Bilbo Baggins, um, finding a, a purpose in life, a seriousness in life, a desire to live life. Of course, he doesn't think like that, but it raises the inner character, even of an adult, to want to taste life more to the full. Now, of course, this is full of characters which don't exist in real life, like the two ogres. Oh, is it three ogres? Three ogres fighting one another about eating Bilbo and his friends. Um, and how they escape that. And then there's, oh, Ariacnid. Ariacnid's lair. What a brilliant piece of writing. Makes you quite tense, very mysterious and dark. And the, the woods which talk and whisper. There's so much in this book. And of course, if they love that, they've got the Lord of the Rings to move on to, which I wouldn't recommend for children. There are some tough bits in there. But certainly, when I say children, I'm talking like 10 years old or younger um, in this case. Older, depending on their reading comprehension, they're going to love Lord of the Rings. And of course, there's films to watch if you so wish to let your children watch those. But the books, absolutely outstanding. The Hobbit may be one of the greatest children books ever written. It's so good in story that adults love it. And in that respect, you just have to call it a classic, not a children's classic. Um, but if you've never read The Hobbit, get it. I promise you it's so worth it. But it comes a whisker behind my favourite children's classic, which to this day I have read multiple times, despite the fact it is supposed to be for kids. Believe me, every dad and granddad loves this book and privately will read it on their own. What is it? Let me tell you. What is the children's classic that I consider the best classic for children ever written so good that like The Hobbit, anyone can read it and thoroughly enjoy themselves, but especially children? Well, if I were to say Robert Louis Stevenson, I think you've already got it. It is none other than the magnificent and thrilling and adventurous Treasure Island. And again, if you can get the Robert Inkpen illustrated version, oh my days, this is just spectacular. The pictures in this book are, well, let me find another one. Oh, can't find them now. Look at that, look at that. He's got that sort of raw way of drawing. Oh, it's just staggering. So, of course, you've got Jim Hawkins is, Hawkins is the main character in this. He lives at the Admirable Bem, Admiral Bembo Inn when someone called the Captain comes along. And uh, he sings that song, 15 men on a dead man's chest with yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum. And he terrifies everyone there, but he pays. And eventually, Jim discovers in his chest a oil packet of papers which contain the coordinates to an island. In fact, it has the island on it. Where one of the X's, the several X's, but one of them says, here be the bulk of the treasure. 
Now the captain is always asking Jim, keep a lookout, he pays him every week a shilling, keep a lookout for a one-legged man, a uh, one-legged pirate. We don't know who that is. Later on, after finding this map, off goes Jim Hawkins to Bristol with some other responsible men because they're going to go and get this treasure, which they know has been all heaped up by pirates and so it doesn't rightfully belong to them. And um, what, what's, what is the, the Hispaniola is the ship uh, named, that's where Dominican Republic and Haiti, that island used to be called Hispaniola. The ship's named after that. And the one of the, they've got their crew together, and one of the crew has got a peg leg, and it's none other than Long John Silver, who befriends Jim, except there's an event when Jim is hiding in the apple barrow. And from there, the story just rip roars. It's rollicking read. There's fights, there's setting up of forts, you know, gunfights, there's threats and oh, marooning and treasure. All sorts of stuff goes on. It doesn't relent. What's so good about it is the perfect building of the plot. The development of story doesn't just give you that hit of adventure. It gives you that beauty of waiting, being on the edge of your suspense till you get to sort of fully into the story. It develops a taste in reading. Taste is something that I talk about in literature on the Patreon group. We just talked about it. And this is how to train your young ones. But like I say, I could flip this around, have The Hobbit first, but I think Treasure Island just pips it as a children's classic. If you've never read it, please get it. Please read it to your children. They will never forget it and the memories it creates with them. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please tell me if you've enjoyed it. I know I haven't put in a lot of other books, so many more books. I could do an entire other video on this topic alone and probably will if you want me to. Um, but these are just spectacular books. They're books, I, some of these books I've still read repeatedly as an adult and they're still just as thrilling, just as good. In fact, I get more out of them now. So if you want to read with your children, if you want to get them off the Xbox and into their imagination, then use any of these books which you think would appeal to your young ones and I even try the ones you're not so sure of because you might be surprised at what they take up. They're, they're at that age to grow their imagination, so give them everything. Until the next time, I wish you and your young ones joy in your reading.